Tuesday. We're here the third Tuesday of every month with a program. We, except we won't be here in December because December is the Christmas bird count. And that's on December 20th, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, before Christmas. And we'd love to have lots of you help, all of you help. Um, because it's important to have eyes and ears in the field. You know, don't think, oh, I can't do this because I'm not a terrific birder. There are seven teams, right? Seven teams. Mm -hmm. And there'll be one or two good birders at least with every team. And, but they can't see everything, hear everything. And so it's a fun way to spend a day or part of a day. And then in the evening, we gather at my house on Whipple Street and we have a compilation potluck. So after we eat everybody's good food, the teams, it's a little bit competitive. <laughs> about, well, I saw this and did you see that? And how many of those did you see? But it's really fun and there's also a historical perspective because we have records for an extended period of time. And so it's interesting to see what we see this year as opposed to maybe what numbers of that species we saw five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. And it's just fun. Besides, most of you are very good, most of our members are very good cooks, so it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing you can do is, if you don't feel you have the time or the inclination to go out and ride around in your assigned area for part of the day, you can do a feeder count from the comfort of your home and then just call in your totals to be added to, into the mix. So, um, if people are interested, you can let me know or I think Meg, Pluga, or there are several people here from different teams so that we're in a little bit of flux because the person who normally coordinates isn't able to, nor is the person who was stepping in to cover for him. So it's going to be a real team effort this year. But if anybody's interested, we'll make sure that you're assigned to a team and each team has its own area to search. Um, so it's great. Hi. I have a question. You do it for a 24 hour period, right? You can. I mean, usually the teams, like, make okay, your so team, for instance. We usually meet at the Chelsea okay. at breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> leave when it starts we to get light. Yeah, it's like 7, 7 And we stay out until either we're too cold, uh -huh. the weather gets too crummy, or we're just not seeing stuff. Yeah. And so I would say typically we're out from 7 30 in the morning until. One or two in the yeah, afternoon. Yeah, so you don't have the owl people. But you well, can. Some Midnight. people do that. Some people, some people do it. But um, the, the way mm -hmm. it's set up, you know, different people just have different amounts of time that they can do. And whatever people can do, it's it's still fun. And you get together and you hear other people's stories. And I know I've learned a lot from going out with other folks and birding. Mm -hmm. And then there's the team that always stops at your house and sees the things yeah, there that you thing. never yes. see. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> they say, well, like, there was this in your tree. <laughs> right. we, have, we, the area we traditionally do is not the area our house is in. Mm -hmm. And somebody else comes and does our house. And every year it's been, well, you know, when we were at Meg and Ned's, we saw us. <laughs> <laughs> Where have they been the other 300? Well, it's like fish stories, right? Yeah. 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 So, but some people do do owls on their own. I mean, yeah. they listen yeah. before they go out or the, in the evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's also something called count week, which is three days either side of mm -hmm. the official yeah. count day. That if there are species we've missed on the official count day, but somebody sees them within our circle, um, either three days before or three days after, up to the other side. We can count that. But if it's a bird we've already seen on the actual day of the count, then we don't count it again. It's just if there are things we think we should have seen and we missed, there are a few people who work hard to go find them. Okay. <laughs> they, and in January, the third Tuesday of January, which is the day after President's, no, Martin Luther King Day. Um, I hope you'll all be here. 
should be a wonderful program. Wendy Redlinger grew up in Yellowstone. Her father was a ranger in Yellowstone in the 30s and 40s. And she has digitized his photos and has his journals, which she's transcribed. And so she's doing a program for us on life in Yellowstone, um, which should be a very interesting perspective. So be sure to come for that. We have our newsletter that comes out four times a year. Perhaps, probably most of you have the newest one that came out um, in October. There are extra copies here if you didn't get one or you like one. There are also are little envelopes to become a local member of Southeastern Vermont Audubon. It's $15 a year and it helps us pay for um, postage to mail you your newsletters and to print your newsletters. So. If you're not a local member, we'd love to have you join us. If you're a member of National, they tell us who in our area is a member of National, and so that makes you a member of our local already. But you can always use extra support. National's given us some things about their new study about birds and climate change, several, quite a few copies of things. So if anybody wants one of those, they're here. We usually do bird gossip. It doesn't have to be about birds, though. About yeah. what, are you, you know, what you're seeing that you want to share with people, what you're not seeing that you think you ought to be seeing. Could be something else. I mean, I'm having gray foxes in my backyard in Marlboro every night. Um, and not last night, probably the night before, saw it behaving in a way I've never seen before. It was just sitting on its haunches eating apples from under the apple tree outside the kitchen window. And Sunday I had seen scat at the end of my driveway that had apple seeds in it, and now I know why. But any other time I've ever seen it feed, it's fed on all fours and just, you know, wandered along the backyard looking for tasty morsels. But, so this was, that was neat for me. And I had a, last two days I've had a rough grouse, which is the first time this year I've had that. Hopefully, December 20th, it will be <laughs> back. It won't have eaten everything, and so we'll be back in the hawthorn or the flowering crab. What about you guys? What are you seeing, not seeing? Questions? Is nobody? Siskins. Your siskins are back again? Oh, nice. I'm moving around, so I don't see it. That's nice. I'm anxiously awaiting red holes to return. Um, this should be a big year for Siskins, red poles, um, birds from further north. Mark? Well, this is not specifically Vermont, then, I'm, but in Massachusetts, I was talking to Norm Smith from Mass. <coughs> and he said they've had their first several snowy owls oh. this winter. <coughs> He's saying it's looking like it may be next year. <coughs> Oh, isn't this really early? It's, it's really Heinsburg. early. There's several. Yeah. They're, they're reporting sightings up in Hinesburg. I'm sorry? Up in Hinesburg, Vermont? In Hinesburg, yeah. Oh. In Vermont, this is okay. <coughs> Now, somebody who lives in Guilford, but pretty much the Guilford Vernon border by the interstate, told me they had a big flock of snow buntings. Oh. And that that seemed really early for them. They said they see them every year, but it yeah. seemed early. So, maybe things really are coming down sooner. Now, on the other hand, we still have bluebirds. Right. And hopefully on the December 20th, we still will. Um, somebody else will get Somebody else will come. But um, it's a little early to start feeding um, because bear are still out and about, although it's awfully hard to resist. <laughs> Especially when you start hearing about siskins around and things like that, and you say, come to my house. Um, so be wary. Yeah, oh, we saw the, uh, the mature bald eagle over there the other day. Oh, nice. nice. Yep. A couple days back. Connecticut? Yep. Yeah. Circling, circling over the Veterans Bridge. Yep. Oh. <laughs> okay. And somebody, a school bus driver in Guilford, told me she had one. 
on, I think, the um, Jacksonville Stage Road, you know, sort of flying along by her bus. So that's nice. Uh, they're, they're a lot more around now. It appears to be quite successful. Yes? Um, I'm just curious. I'd love to see records of when migratory birds mm -hmm. leave this area and come back by species. Is mm -hmm. that something that... Uh, anybody locally? I think yeah. maybe people do that in terms of their own yard, their first first of the season, last of the season. I'm always wondering about hummingbirds in particular. Um, how do you know when to take the in? Mm -hmm. Usually it's like late September, right, John? For the hummingbirds? Or, or even mid September. Mid September to late? Oh, okay. Thanks. There's also, do you know about the, the field cards? There's a, there's a, who's got the Vermont field card these days? Are those still available through Eco Studies? Maybe. Um, yeah. That basically lists, yeah. it's, for, it's statewide, but it's a very helpful yeah. guide because yeah. it lists all the species and it'll give you whether it's a permanent resident yeah. uh, or a, a migratory yeah. and it'll give you, they've got this little code that like if it says, yeah. I don't know, 3A, that would be mm -hmm. the first week in March yeah. mm -hmm. through yeah. whatever. And so it gives you a sort of a sense of yeah. scale. Okay. Yeah. Also, also Brian Piper's book has an appendix, I think, okay. it is the back. Oh, that's right. that stuff. But yeah. you can get that online, too, I think. If you, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to finding stuff for this area, <coughs> but, um, but I didn't know where to find yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. it. Down, but, um, What's the name of that place up in... Um, uh, Woodstock. Oh, Vermont Institute Vins. of Natural. Yeah, Vins. Oh, they, if you could look at their website, I think they publish all of that. Right, and also the Vermont Center of Eco for Eco Studies yeah. in yeah. Norwich, Vermont, has a lot of that. Well, the Bird Act, which has all of it, but mm -hmm. it's not accessible, but it might be through the Vermont Center of mm -hmm. Eco Studies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And in August. Somebody from the Vermont Center of Eco Studies is coming to do a bumblebee program for us. So, about the research that's being done in Vermont, or that she's doing in Vermont on bumblebees. But tonight, Mark Parkhurst is here. He's done a couple of programs for us before, and he's always fascinating. Mark is a wildlife veterinarian, he's, or probably more than just wildlife, but. Um, at the Tufts School of Veterinary Medicine. And he also comes from Massachusetts and helps with the Christmas count every year. So he's, you're part of us, Mark. <laughs> Even though you live across the border, we'll, we definitely want you. So, Mark. Okay. Well, thank you. And if somebody wants to get the lights, if you don't need to see me, you need to see the pictures. <laughs> so, when I've come in the past and done programs, they've been sort of focused programs on uh, you know specific topics, uh, birding with a wildlife veterinarian, or some of the work we've done with loons, um, where we had uh, Eric Hansen from the Center for Eco Studies with us. And tonight, this is this is a little more of a mishmash. Um, it's not even all birds. And as usual, I made the the mistake. I've got way too many stories to tell and slides to go in. And so we don't have, to, we probably should finish unless you want to be here till midnight. Um, and I'm hungry, so I, I don't want to be here till midnight. But um, we can do this at a number of different paces. And so I'll need feedback from you in terms of what you want to do and what stories you want to hear and how much depth we want to go in. But first I thought I'd show you a little bit about where we are. This is the wildlife clinic at the Tufts Veterinary School, and some of our students and staff, Dr. Floatsang, who's the current director down there in the lower right, she took over from me in 2008. Um, and this is a hospital for native wildlife. And we see all sorts of species of native wildlife. And our, our students at the veterinary school rotate through here. I think we're the only veterinary school in the world where uh, a core wildlife rotation is required of all veterinary students. So all the veterinary students coming through get a little bit of basic stuff. And we have facilities for you know all different kinds of animals. Um, should we do the quiz? Everybody know what all these are? <laughs> um, what are those? Mallards. Mallards. This would be a saltwater. 
Red breast lemur gander sitting around. That's yeah. it. Yeah. It's a northern gander, an immature yeah. northern gander, probably about a three year old. Mm -hmm. And so having facilities for them and knowing what they eat is important to make, making sure we can do proper nutrition for all the different animals. And so a lot of what our veterinary students learn is not the doctor stuff. Because when they come through the clinic, a lot of them have had clinical experience with many other species. And they know how to do x-rays and they know how to do <coughs> blood work and all those kinds of things. But we're teaching them what's different about wildlife about how important it is to know the natural history of all these different species and the behavior and what stresses the animals. And how do you get a recalcitrant hawk or a recalcitrant snapping turtle to eat? You wouldn't think snapping turtles could be recalcitrant. But there's, there's nothing more stubborn than a stubborn turtle. <laughs> they could go a long time without you know, eating or drinking or breathing if they have to. Um, a lot of our work at the wildlife clinic is seasonal. As you might expect, in the spring we get a lot of babies, and a lot of these are what people call orphans, and, and we really know are sort of pseudo-orphans because they've really been kidnapped most of the time by people. Um, and we can talk about that more if you'd like to, but we've got baby gray squirrels, cottontail rabbits, possums, and that's a young beaver. Um, and beavers are fun. I, I actually like the big rodents. Beavers and, and porcupines are, are a lot of fun to work with. Um, I don't think I put any porcupine pictures in tonight, although I had some good ones of porcupines with skin disease, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd be amazed at how common skin disease is in porcupines. Um, we see a fair number, but we'll save that story for another time. We see a lot of different baby birds, and you probably know all these. Um, house finches, red-tailed hawk, wood ducks, pigeon, barred owl, and robins. And again, you know, veterinary students, I love our veterinary students, but, and they come with fabulous undergraduate backgrounds in biology. You know, they know so much biochemistry and molecular biology and physiology and things, but they don't necessarily know a lot of practical field biology, like birders know, uh, and many Audubon Society members know. So having them identify that, <laughs> can be difficult. You know, it's little and pink. Um, <laughs> yeah. Teaching them the difference between altricial and precocial. Um, some of the basic sorts of things that we feel is, are sort of automatic um, is not necessarily in the, in the vocabulary of some of our veterinary students. So they learn a lot of basic biology. What we mostly see, other than babies at the wildlife clinic, is we see a lot of trauma. A lot of things that are damaged by human activities, directly or, in, or indirectly. And it can be kind of discouraging sometimes. We see a lot of animals hit by cars, a lot of head injuries. Um, and so we've got a great horned owl and a screech owl and a three-year-old bald eagle. And I'm trying, I believe that's a red tail with blood in the eye. And so we do a lot of you know, very basic trauma doctoring. You know, what in, in human medicine you might call more like a mash unit or, or meatball surgery, I've heard it referred to. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be fancy, but one of the things that the students learn in doing this is that the tools are universal. And so if you look at, you know, Dr. Tseng with the ophthalmoscope, or Suzanne, one of our students there, looked at the bald eagle's eye. Um, you know, that's a standard Welsh Allen 3844 ophthalmoscope. You know, if you've been to the eye doctor, the eye doctor's probably looked at your eye with that same instrument. And so this is one of the things I love about being a veterinarian, is that once you know how to use a tool, you can use that tool on so many different species. And actually, I use that sort of approach sometimes to tease MDs. Um, and I have a, a lot of fun teasing MDs when I'm, when I'm talking. We call them MDs, or sometimes we call them RDs for real doctor. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I say to MDs, you know, and I don't know if any of you are MDs, so I should apologize ahead of time. Um, but, you know, with MDs, they go to school for just as long as veterinarians do. They study just as hard. They take all these hard exams. They take national boards, and they get this wonderful license at the end. And their license is good for one species. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's fine. 
You know, there's nothing wrong with that species, but my license covers everything on the planet defined as an animal, vertebrate or invertebrate, everything except for one species. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to tease FDAs about that. That's always kind of fun. There's no further specialization? Oh, absolutely. Of that now, don't they have like big animals? You, know, you do, but but but, in, in terms of degrees, but your license, yeah, you're licensed for everything. You know, you may get, you may develop a specialization, uh -huh. and and you know, as Meg and Ned can tell you, um, you know, they regularly ask me horse questions, and I say to them, you know, I haven't even thought about a horse since I graduated from veterinary school. All I remember about horses is I can tell the brown ones from the right, the white ones, um, <laughs> you know. And, and you know, and people, I'll go up, you know, in, in a party, and people will start asking me about their cat that's vomiting or something. Well, <laughs> you know, if it's a lion or a tiger, I know what to do. But a house cat, I don't know. know. It's, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, this is Suzanne looking at that bald eagle again. I put this in because you realize the most important person in this picture isn't the veterinarian with the ophthalmoscope, it's the person holding the eagle. <laughs> because if they do it wrong, somebody's going to get hurt. You know, either Suzanne will end up with piercings that she doesn't want, or, you know, or the eagle may get injured. So we all want to be careful all the way around. But you know, it's cool in wildlife because you get to see these animals up close and personal. You were talking before about a gray fox. They're, they are fabulous, gorgeous animals. I should have stuck some pictures of gray foxes in. Um, but you know, you see them up close. That, am I, 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 I can see. Okay. Um, you get to know these animals like this hoary bat up close and personal, and, and in a way that it's very intimate. You know, you're handling them. You you got them in captivity. You're trying to get them to eat. You're attuned to their sounds and their smells and how they act and how they respond to things. And you get to love all these animals. And you know, people will often say to me, "Well, what's your favorite animal?" And I can never answer that, because it depends on what I've been working with and what fascinating problems we've seen and what's bitten me recently. <laughs> <laughs> Are those teeth in the back? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. That lovely little canine teeth there, and sure, and, and very sharp molars. Um, you have to remember, these are insect eaters. The only bats we have up around here are insects. And so they need fairly sharp little teeth to catch insects and to break through their, their um, chitinous exoskeletons. Sure. And they hurt if they bite. <laughs> I've had my rabies shots. Um, and this is a possum that got hit by a car. And we were anesthetizing her. Now, you know, this too, this is like the, the ophthalmoscope we were using before. People will say, well, how do you anesthetize a possum? Well, think about the veterinarian that you might take your dog or cat to. They're doing dogs, they're doing cats. They may do a bunny or a ferret, or maybe a parrot, or something of that nature. But once you've got the anesthesia machine, and you know how to use it, you can use it on a wide variety of different things. This machine that we're using on the possum is actually a human pediatric machine. You know, an animal's an animal's an animal in many respects. We're breathing the same air um, at the same atmospheric pressure. And so once you've learned how to use the anesthesia machine, um, you can anesthetize a wide variety of different things. And we'll see some more slides later. I remember when I was in veterinary school and taking anesthesia rotation, somebody said very wisely, there's no such thing as a safe anesthetic or a safe anesthesia machine. There's only a safe anesthesiologist. So it's not the machine. It's the dummy who's using the machine um, that can determine whether or not the animal wakes up. But we had her down on the table because she had a head injury, as all possums hit by cars. Of course, we could tell that was a female because she's got a well-developed pouch. This, of course, is our only native marsupial. And you were mentioning before about climate change. These are a really good example of climate change. Um, <clears throat> I mean, if you think about marsupials, where are most of the marsupials in the world? Australia. Australia. What's the continent with the second most marsupials? South America. Brazil. South America. OK? It turns out that Australia and the Antarctic continent and South America were once joined. And there are a lot of marsupial fossils in Antarctica. And North America and South America were separate until 
Nettle probably, what was it? 15 million years oh, ago? Oh, much so less than that. Less, less than, than that. A few million years ago. Okay. Relatively recently, yesterday, <laughs> in geological time. And so what happened after the two continents joined is one marsupial, the opossum, made it from South America up into North America, and it's moving north steadily. Um, opossums are just in New England in the last 50 or 60 years. They just got into Canada in the last couple of decades. Um, and so they are one of those signs of climate change. And there are a lot of birds like that, too. If you think about things like tufted titmice and cardinals and red-bellied woodpeckers. Um, I don't know how many of you have looked at Peterson's Field Guide, but I think the first edition came out, what was it 1939, I think? I, I wasn't here, but I, I've seen the edition. And cardinals and titmice were not in New England when the first edition of Peterson's Field Guide came out. They're, they're later editions. Um, so anyway, I, this is what happens. We start telling stories and we don't get to the slides. But anyway, we looked at that possum and look what's in her pouch. Oh. Baby. Um, and you know, with marsupials, it's really interesting because the, you know, the babies are born, they're, they're about the size of a bee when they're born. And they're totally naked and totally helpless and they don't have any hind legs developed when they're born, but they have huge, strong front legs. And this is true of kangaroos, it's true of a number of marsupials. And what they do when they're born is they come out of the vagina of the female, and then they go hand over hand, they have to crawl up the fur on her belly and get into her pouch and latch onto a nipple. And the mother licks the fur on her belly to sort of wet it down and make it easier for them to crawl up there. But they go hand over hand, crawling up that belly fur, get in there, and they swallow the nipple, and the nipple goes all the way down to their stomachs. Oh, no. And then and they're sitting in there, and so they're like glued onto the mother for weeks and weeks and weeks as they develop. Um, and they're teeny at that point. What's their gest gestation period? Well, the trick, it's very short. and. You know, I'm standing here being embarrassed because I don't specifically remember. I think it's in the low 20s, 22 days or something of that nature. But then they spend another several weeks in the pouch as they're growing and getting larger. Another one of those trivia points with the possum that we point out, in most species of mammals, the female has paired mammary glands, so it's always an even number, two, four, six, eight, depending on the species. Possums have an uneven number, they have 13. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Those are, they've probably been in the pouch, oh, almost a week at that point. They're much bigger than they would have been earlier. Now, are they affected by the fact that the mother's having anesthesia? We keep the anesthesia really short, <laughs> because they could be, sure. A lot of the anesthetics, both the injectables and the inhalants, can depress the young. Um, but of course, here they're not connected to the blood supply anymore. So we don't have to worry about placental transfer of anything. We'd have to worry about what would be soluble in the milk. So we do all the standard techniques. Um, you know, taking x-rays. This is a, a young herring gull. Um, getting a, a nice x-ray on him or her. I can't tell. And here's what the x-ray looks like. <laughs> and, you know, I've had things like this up on the wall when doctors come through, MD, <laughs> and they look at this and they say, gee, it's not that different from us. You know, and they're right. Uh, this is one of the wonderful things about comparative anatomy and, and about <coughs> veterinary medicine is how similar the body plan is. You know, they've got a heart, they've got a liver, they've got blood vessels. You know, I could, we could name all the blood vessels if you really want to stay here for a while and be bored. Um, they've got a shoulder and an elbow and a knee and hips and kidneys and everything else. And so a lot of what the veterinary students spend time doing is just learning the differences between the species and learning, training their eyes really to detect all these fine shades of gray and what all these fine shades mean and how to tell one from another. And so here's an example of that kind of thing. This is a uh, female peregrine that hit a window in downtown Boston. She ran into a big plate glass window on the Christian Science Center and broke away. And you may not, you may not be used to looking at 
um, bird x-rays, but you can tell that this shoulder area looks very different from this shoulder area. Okay? This is the broken one. <coughs> and the, so what I've done is I've sort of, whoops, why didn't that come up? Well, there it did. It did come up. Okay. So I've sort of outlined, there's a bone here called the coracoid, and it's intact on this side and it's broken on that side. <coughs> And you can see that things are displaced a little bit. But this is something that, you know, it's a bone. Um, you know, surgeons know how to repair bones really well. In fact, you know, fixing bones is kind of fun. Um, I don't, how many of you are into carpentry? <laughs> you know, orthopedic surgery, bone surgery, it's just carpentry that bleeds. Um, you know, it's kind of fun because you get to use power tools, so it's like boys, it's like boys and their toys. You, know, you get to drill holes in things and put screws in things and you know, tighten wires. And, you know, the tools are more expensive um, because they're all made out of stainless steel and anything that you can call a medical tool, they add at least one zero to the price. Um, so, you know, you can use a Black & Decker 3 8 inch drill, but it's not as fancy as a stainless steel striker drill. Um, but basically, we know how to fix bones. There's nothing magic to this. Um, you know, bird bones might be a little different shape, um, a little thinner in some cases, but the tools and the, the mental and technical approaches are about the same, and there's several different ways to fix this. So we did surgery and repair it, and then here she is sitting with a bandage. And this too, this is one of those cool things about working with wildlife and, and veterinary medicine. You know, I can't go to a, a catalog anywhere and order a size for splint for a peregrine falcon. I mean, there's just, who makes these things? Um, there's no market for it. And so, you remember that old TV show, MacGyver? Yeah. Where the guy would just sort of have to invent based with whatever he had there. Oh, I've got a bicycle pump and two rubber bands. And, and so that's, you have to do a lot of that in veterinary medicine, is figuring out we've got these tools. We've got, you know, bandage that was made for a horse or bandage that was made for a dog. And we have to figure out how to fit it to this animal in a way that the animal will be comfortable with it and it'll hold the wing in the right position and the bones will heal and she won't tear it off. And so there's, there's more art than science. <coughs> to this sort of thing. But Excuse me. It, yeah, please. Is the uh, white on that inflammation from the fracture? Um, the white is a couple of things. Um, it's a, that's a good question. It's not so much inflammation as it is, one is it's what we call uh, overlapping densities. <coughs> and because that bone is broken, things are lying over one another that wouldn't normally be. And so you've got things that, instead of just having one thickness of bone for the x-rays to shoot through, you might have two thicknesses of bone, so it looks whiter. The other reason that it's kind of fuzzy there is the bones have actually started to heal. The outer layer of the bone, the part we call the periosteum, has become activated and is trying to lay down more calcium in there to heal the fracture. And so that's one reason that, that it looks denser like that. And that's the other thing I love about bone surgery. If you think about carpentry, if you screw up, you're stuck with it. I mean, how many of you have made a picture frame where the corners didn't quite <laughs> line up? Okay? You, you do that with a bone, and what happens? It heals. Oh, my God. I wish picture frames would heal. Um, <laughs> that bird kind of struggle, do they kind of struggle, or are they more comfortable after they've been... Uh, it depends on the animal. In general, they, they hate you more as time goes on, um, and they become harder to handle. But very often with wild animals, when they first come in, they're so terrified, they're almost petrified with fear. And so you have a little bit of an advantage. But once you've handled them a couple of times, and they sort of know your tricks, it actually becomes harder to handle them in most cases. Got a question over here. Mark. Yeah. Quick question. yeah, please. Since birds have hollow bones, sure. I would think they would shatter and it would be very different to have to treat a bird with a broken bone than any mammals, say. There's a lot of yeses and nos to that. Um, okay. I probably have on the laptop a two-hour lecture on orthopedic okay. surgery, <laughs> but no, no, no. <laughs> um, well, the, 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 first, the first interesting thing is not all bones are hollow okay. in birds. Um, and in fact, in most species of birds, the coracoid is not. Um, 
thank goodness the corpoids are very solid bone. But if you look at the humerus here, the upper arm bone, that is hollow. And it, bird bones, it's not so much that they're more fragile, but they're more highly mineralized than mammal bones are. And so they do tend to shatter a little bit more like eggshells. So you t tend to have more small pieces. Mm -hmm. And it can be frequently a little trickier to put them all back together. But, but again, think about a jigsaw puzzle with a missing piece. If you, a piece doesn't fit back in, your jigsaw puzzle always looks ugly. With a bone, if you have a little piece that doesn't fit back in, or the bone is dead, if you leave it out, it's going to heal across that space. It may take a little more time. But bone can be very forgiving if you handle it right. How long would it take this bird to recover from this? What well, you know, that's one of the things I love working about birds, is birds heal way faster than mammals. <laughs> Have any of you broken a bone? <laughs> okay. Think about how long it takes in people. Okay, you had probably a cast on for how long? Five to six weeks. Five to six weeks, and then you had to be a little careful after that, probably. And then you start PT. Sure. The bandage, if if there aren't complications, and it's a relatively simple fracture, the bandage comes off at two weeks. The bird will be flying between three and four weeks. Wow. Yeah. Snapping turtles. I love snapping turtles. <laughs> they're, they're like our local dinosaur. I know they're not at all related to dinosaurs, but they're cool. They're the biggest reptile we've got, and they're kind of fearsome. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> this is one of our students. That's probably about a 30-pound snapping turtle, and that could, that could do your damage. Um, and so one of the first things we teach the veterinary students is the most important question before you even say what species is it, the most important question is, what does this species have that can hurt me? Mm -hmm. um, and how do I avoid it? And so holding a snapping turtle correctly is important. And, and Don is doing a nice job with this one. And then, of course, you have to be able to do other things. Like if you've got a turtle and you want to do doctor stuff, you know, you've got to be able to take blood. Uh, this is the tail vein in this um, slider that Allison's taking blood from. But again, think about this from the tool's point of view. Okay. I'm a veterinarian. Give me the right size syringe and the right size needle, and I should be able to take blood from almost anything. Okay. Again, think about what your license gets. So, you know, if you've got a horse, have you seen a veterinarian take blood from a horse? Sure, they use a big syringe and a big needle, and the horse has this lovely big neck vein, and it's not hard to do. If you've had a dog or a cat, you've seen the veterinarian take blood from them. This isn't that different. It's a little bit different sized needle, and it's knowing where the vein is. But, you know, conceptually, if an animal's got body fluids, you can get body fluids from it. And I say body fluids because, of course, with some species, particularly invertebrates, we don't necessarily call it blood. It's not in vessels, or the pigment may not be iron-based, it may be copper-based or something, we might call it hemolymph. But I've taken, you know, I've taken blood from um, sharks, I've taken blood from bald eagles, I've taken hemolymph from clams and tarantulas. Um, and so if, it, if there's fluids in there, we can get it, and we can do doctor stuff with it. You know, it'll have protein in it, it'll have cells in it, we can do diagnostic medicine on almost anything. And here's a snapping turtle that's being repaired. Uh, Stefan is a fourth year student, and he's having a great time. This was hit by a car, and he gets to practice his, sur his surgical techniques, suturing up a neck wound in the snapping turtle. But again, you know, this animal's anesthetized, otherwise he wouldn't be that close to the head end. And this again, this is a, this is a pediatric anesthesia machine. This is made for children. Um, and, the, and the tube we've got going into that animal's trachea is a tube made for, for preemies, um, for, for preemie children. So it's just finding the right size tool and adapting it to the species you want to deal with. The gas we're using here, isoflurane, is a gas that we use on horses and dogs and children and adults and you know, almost any animal you want. How did you get the tube into the turtle? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> um, first, it, it, the way we do that varies with species to, from species to species. In many species, we will first give them an injectable anesthetic, 
to to so that it makes us makes it safe to open the mouth and stick your fingers in there. Um, and so that's what we did with the, with this turtle. We put a, a, a anesthetic called propofol into a tail vein, and then the turtle, after a few minutes, just becomes limp, um, and you can safely handle the head and put the endotracheal tube in, and then put it on gas. Propofol is a nice anesthetic for short-term sorts of things, but for long-term, gas is much safer. It's much easier to adjust the depth of anesthesia for your patients with a gas anesthetic. Mark, what, what about what's going to be the prognosis for this turtle? It looks like there's quite a damage to the shell. I'll show you some more later on that, that are worse. No, this doesn't have too bad a shell um, damage. It's, it's mostly a, a, to the skin and muscle over the back of the neck. <coughs> um, sna again, snapping turtles are really tough. Um, <coughs> they can take quite a licking and still come back. We've got a pretty good success rate, particularly with bigger ones like this. Anesthesia and intubating animals, there's a snapping turtle, but what about a snake? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Same anesthesia machine, and we've got a cardiac monitor on it. <laughs> what kind of snake? Uh, let me see. This is a um, black rat snake. This is for a study that the Massachusetts um, Fish and Game Department was doing. So again, just the kind of thing that you do with other, any, other, any other animal. You know, we want to monitor its vital signs. We want to be able to control the depth of anesthesia. Um, you know, there are. You know, the, one of the questions is where's the heart? <coughs> but you know, we know basically where that is in snakes. And this is this is a, a very simple Doppler machine um, that we're using to monitor the, the heart rate in this animal. You can do a bald eagle. Mm -hmm. um, you can do a bobcat. Um, do animals come out of the anesthesia quickly? Or? If you do it right, they come out very quickly. Um, watch out. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, partly it depends on what techniques you're using. If you've used an injectable, like propofol or ketamine xylazine or some of the other sorts of things, that can hang around longer and can slow the recovery, but if the animal's on gas, as you bring as you bring the level of gas anesthesia down, they'll begin waking up fairly quickly. And I'm a chicken anesthesiologist. I don't want my animals too deep and dying on the table. I like them as light as we can keep them, consistent with you know, pain relief for the animal and safety for the people working on it. So I consider it a success if the animals pop up pretty quickly. The other variable here is how long have they been down. The longer they're down, they get a little dehydrated, they can get cold, they can get hypothermic, their fat, fatty tissues can saturate a little more with the anesthetic gases. So if they're down longer, it can take them a little, a little more to get up, to come up. But we can control for that. But don't they generally have less tolerance than, let's say, humans who could undergo a four-hour operation? It, it turns out that the, that the tolerance is not so much dependent on um, whether they're humans or not. It really has to do with something we call metabolic size. Okay, that's what, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the size of the animal and its metabolic rate. Right. Um, so basically, if you think about <clears throat> how quickly time passes for us, I mean, think about, um, well, let me, let me come with a much more concrete metaphor or, or example of this. <clears throat> a good way to look at metabolic time is heart rate. Okay? Mm -hmm. Roughly, what's a typical human heart rate? 70. Okay, about 70, so a little bit more than one per second kind of a thing. Okay? So time is passing at this sort of rate for us. Okay? Now let's take a mouse. Okay? You get a little 30 gram periscus or lab mouse or something like that. What's a resting heart rate on a mouse? More so. Hmm? Twice so. Oh, way more than twice. Oh, that. Yeah, it's probably resting, it's probably 350 or 400. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, how about a hummingbird? Oh, okay. You know, between 800 and 1,000. Okay. And so basically what's happening is their time is passed. 
time is passing faster for them. And so instead of the clock ticking like this, the clock's ticking like this for them. And so if we think about an hour of anesthetic time for a person and do the sort of correction by metabolic rate, with heart rate being sort of an example of that, an hour of, of surgical time for a person is probably equivalent to something like 10 hours of surgical time in terms of stress on the body for a hummingbird. Now, go the other way. Go to a bigger animal, something that's got... Um, you like the bobcat, what's that? Well, you know, that's, that's going to be like your typical... I mean, that's about a 30-pound animal, so it's going to be your, like your typical you know, fat beagle or something. It's probably going to have a heart rate of 120, something in that nature. So faster than a person, but nowhere near as fast as a mouse or a hummingbird. But if you take, you know, a horse, you know, with a resting heart rate of 35 or something of that nature, time is passing more slowly from a metabolic perspective. And so you have other variables you have to consider. If you've got a big animal like a horse or a really big animal like an elephant, and you've got to knock it down from a metabolic point of view, everything is slowed down and you don't have to worry so much. But you have problems with having a big animal like that being recumbent. You have problems with it inflating its lungs. You have problems with appropriate blood flow around the body. You have problems with temperature control. And so there are different variables that may limit the amount of time you want to keep a big animal down. So anyway, the, most of these animals that we see, including this bobcat, has been hit by cars. This bobcat's about to have a leg shaved up to have some pins put in its, its femur for a broken femur. But we do see a lot of things hit by cars. Um, you know, we've divided the world up into such a way that, you know, whether you're a turtle or a toad, um, it's hard to get from one side of the stream to the other. Um, or from your breeding ground to your wintering ground without crossing roads. And so animals do get hit by cars. And a lot of what we see in the mm. summer are mm. turtles. This is a painted turtle. Um, and that's a fairly severe fracture. And you can see, if you look at the x-ray, we can tell gender on that one. What gender is it? Female. Yeah, female. She's got four eggs in her. Mm -hmm. Two in each over them. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, the other way, of course, with painted turtles that we could tell it was a female is that the front males are short. If it was a boy, the fr it would have these long mandarin sort of front nails. And those are used in courtship. Um, but th although this looks like a terrible fracture, this was actually repairable. And, and think about how you might go about repairing it. What's the shell made out of? Um, it's bone covered with keratin. So the outer surface, the part that has the colors on the painted turtle, is like your fingernails. It's keratin. But right under that is bone. What bones are they? Ribs. Oh, you're good. OK. So the top of the shell is expanded ribs, and the bottom of the shell is expanded sternum. So you've all seen cartoons where the turtle gets out of the shell and runs around and gets back in the shell. They can no more do that than you could get out of your skeleton. This is part of their skeleton. But again, it's bone, and so you can treat it like surgically like bone. Mm -hmm. If it's got damaged edges, you can debride them. You can use bone cement. You can use um, all kinds of techniques for repairing the bone and getting it to heal. This is a good example of a less serious one in a, a, another little painted turtle. And you can see bone cement in the crack and some cerclage wires that haven't yet been tightened there to put that back together. Mm -hmm. So just a sequence of very size snapping turtles being repaired. And again, they're tough. You know, you see big wounds like this in the shell of a snapping turtle. And as long as the bone is intact, that's sort of equivalent to falling off your bicycle and skinning your knee really badly. You know, it's undoubtedly painful. Um, but it's not something that is life-threatening for those animals. But like any wound, you have to prevent it from being infected. You have to treat it appropriately um, to get it to heal right. But they're fun to deal with. Does the cement slough off? Or um, depends or? on what we're using. We use a lot of different materials. Some of them slough off. Some of them can be absorbed. 
Some of them have a calcium hydroxyapatite matrix <coughs> that can actually be incorporated into new bone. So we have different materials that we use for different kinds of wounds. Um, we use things sometimes like medical honey um, to try and get the wounds to heal. There's a lot of interesting uh, biogels and things that are being used and developed for wound healing in people that we use on animals as well. Now, we were saying before how quickly birds heal. What do you think about turtles? Really slow. <laughs> really slow. So, you know, if a bone is going to heal in, you know, a month in a bird and two months in a, in a person, it's probably going to be six months in a turtle. So everything's really slow. But we have to do the same kind of diagnostics. So we take x-rays. Um, that's a roll of surgical tape under the turtle so it won't crawl off the cassette. <laughs> um, and this is a lateral x-ray of a turtle. This is a Blanding's turtle. And you can see that it's got its head pulled in. That's the, the neck. See those are the vertebrae of the neck curled up in there, as we're seeing from the side. And this black triangular area are the lungs. Do they have unusually large lungs for the size of their body because they stay under so long? No, it, you know, it's interesting. For animals that stay under a long time, and this is true of penguins and whales and turtles and, and a lot of uh, animals, um, they don't store the oxygen in their lungs. Um, there are special chemicals, things like myoglobin, that are actually in the muscles and in some other tissues in the body that can become saturated with oxygen and store the oxygen for long periods of time that the animals can use. So it turns out that with a lot of diving animals, if you look at whales, the lungs are impossibly small for the size of the animal because they're not really storing their oxygen there for diving. Here's another one. And again, you can see the cracks in the shell from being hit. But she's repairable, yeah. Now, we, we sort of faced with two classes of issues here. Most of the turtles we get hit by cars are females. Why do you think that is? Right. Yeah, the males are staying in the woods, are staying in the ponds, and the females are the ones that are traveling longer distances to look for appropriate habitats to lay their eggs. So they're, they're in more danger from the point of view of human damage kinds of stuff. And many times we can fix them and repair them, but sometimes we can't. Sometimes the female is killed or damaged so badly that we have to euthanize her. And when that happens, we harvest the eggs. <coughs> These are all turtle eggs, and we've got two species here. The big round ones are snapping turtles, and the smaller elliptical ones are painted turtle eggs. Um, and one of the things you have to know about a lot of species of reptiles, and it's true of turtles and it's true of crocodiles and their relatives, is that the, the sex of the animals is determined at, by what temperature you incubate the eggs. It's not genetics. Okay? There's no X and Y chromosomes to determine genetics in a lot of species of reptiles. And it works differently in turtles than it does in crocodiles and their relatives. But basically with turtles, if you incubate the eggs at a lower temperature, you get all males. If you incubate the eggs, same eggs, at a higher temperature, you get all females. And so you want to pick a temperature that's in between so you get a few of both <laughs> because we need both in the population. But um, this is a fairly well understood phenomenon. With crocodiles and their relatives, it's, it's a bell-shaped curve. Low temperatures and high temperatures both give you males, and temperatures in the middle give you females. Uh, well, with the turtles, what's high and what's low? Depends on the species of turtle. Of course. That, you know, it's, and this is where talking to the students about the biology of the species is important. You know, if we're thinking about diamondback terrapins that are nesting out on beaches or sea turtles or something, you have one range of temperatures. If we're thinking about woodland turtles, like painted turtles, you have, I'm sorry, box turtles, you have another range of temperatures. So, and the ranges have been pretty well defined for most of the common species. But this is fun. We have incubators full of, I think we're incubating 260 turtle eggs or something right at the moment. 
So in, in the wild, do the animals mainly have just one sex, or do they find the perfect temperature and have both? Or? Um, one of the most important things that the female turtle can do is pick the right spot to lay her eggs. And female turtles are incredibly fussy about this. Um, if you think about a snapping turtle, <clears throat> I mean, we saw some painted turtle pictures where you saw four eggs or six eggs or something. And very frequently she'll lay two eggs in one place and two eggs in another place. A, a big snapping turtle can have 60 or 80 eggs in her. Um, and she'll lay, she'll lay those eggs in maybe five to ten different places. So she's, you know, dividing the clutches to increase her chance that some will hatch and the predators won't eat them. But they're very particular when they're picking their site to pick soil that's just the right um, texture and just the right degree of moisture and, and that has the right sun exposure, too. Hmm. You know, they've evolved over millions of years to be very sensitive to these things. But one of the things that people are very concerned about with climate change, with mm -hmm. turtle conservation and with crocodile conservation, is that it wouldn't take much of a temperature change in the environment to change the sex ratios of how the eggs hatch. And what would happen if we ended up with all males or all females? It wouldn't matter how good your other conservation programs were. They wouldn't have much of a, a population. So it's another one of those things that herpetologists and conservation biologists worry about a whole lot. And there's nothing cuter than baby turtles. <laughs> this is, those are my fingers. That's a baby Blanding's turtle that's just hatched. Um, and, and they're fun. And we keep them around. We do what's called head starting. We, we, <laughs> feed, we feed them um, for a fairly uh, extended period of weeks, and we try and grow them a little bit bigger before we release them so that they're less um, susceptible to be taken by predators. So again, we get lots of different species. We talked about, oh, there's that bobcat shaved up. And Flo and, and Maureen have a bear here on the table. So we see all kinds of things. We tend to see species in proportion to how common they are around you. I mean, if you think about it, the animals aren't bringing themselves into us. People have to find them. So most of the species that come to us are the species that people find most often. We get a lot more red-tailed hawks than we do peregrine falcons. You know, we get a lot more gray squirrels than we do bears. Um, we get a lot more painted turtles and snapping turtles than we do uh, Blanding's turtles. So let's run through a case, okay? This is a male red fox. We talked about foxes before. And here's the history on this case. It was found at a construction site. It weighed six pounds, and the face looks ugly. The eyelids are crusted shut. It's all dry and crusty on its muzzle. And often when I use this as a, as a sort of a quiz case with veterinary students, and I get them to think about it. And I won't do that tonight because I, I want to get on with other stories. Um, but I get the vet students to think about what could be causing this? Is there anything at a construction site that could cause this? Mm. What, is six pounds normal for a red fox? Anybody know? What's a red fox weigh? 20. It, mm, I hear 20. 15 anyway. I hear 15 anyway. Yeah. <laughs> your, your average red fox in New England is 11 pounds. Wow. Um, and so this is, this is pretty light. That we owe, everybody always guesses more because A, they have a very a lot of fur, they're fluffy, and they've got long legs. And they look like they should weigh 30 pounds. Everybody usually guesses 30, so you guys did better than most people do. Um, but anyway, this is the presentation, and I don't know if you can tell, but the eyes are sort of crusty, <coughs> and there's sort of pussy goop coming out of the eyes. And it wasn't just confined to the face. If you look at the rest of the body, it's on the legs, it's on the back, it's all this crusty stuff. And so we have to figure out what's going on. And one of the issues here, of course, is, and I hate to bring this up, it's money. Um, who pays for taking care of wildlife? We <laughs> do. If, if you're susceptible to, to the, the PR that we put out, yes, it, you know, and, and you're, you're good for making donations, sure. Um, you know, we, we ask people who bring wild animals in to make a donation. We have, we sell t-shirts and things just like every nonprofit does. But there are no government monies going to wildlife care. 
and so this is, you know, this is just like an animal shelter. <laughs> it's just like, you know, raising money for a, you know, a project in church or something like that. Is you have to get people to donate for for this to take place because we don't have owners we can charge. You know, if you've got a horse or a cat or a dog, you don't leave the vets without a bill <laughs> or leaving them with a, a, a deposit at least. Here, there's nobody we can hand the bill to, and so keeping things as cheap as possible is always important and I think that's a good thing to be teaching our veterinary students you know how can we do decent health care at reasonable cost we should talk to more MDs about that um, <laughs> but and so you know the students always come up with brilliant ideas of things they want to do oh let's do blood work let's do x-rays let's do a CT and an MRI um, you know, let's do a biopsy and send it in for histopathology and culture. And, and then I tell them the costs of all those tests, <laughs> okay? I mean, you know, histopathology is going to run us you know, $60 and the culture is going to run us $65 unless we want to do anaerobic and then it's going to be over $100. And so we sort of cost this all up and I say, what can you do for 10 bucks? <laughs> and, you know, the answer is, well, what we're seeing is mostly on the skin. Let's do something cheap and quick, and it's called a skin scraping. So for a skin scraping, you need a scalpel blade, a couple of drops of a clear oil, like mineral oil, and a microscope slide. So, so far, I've spent like $3. Um, and we're going to, so we're scraping the skin. And this is, I'm cheating. This is a dog picture. This is not a fox picture. Um, so we're doing the scraping of the skin with the scalpel blade, and we get this crusty, yucky stuff on the scalpel blade in the mineral oil. We put it on the microscope slide, and we're going to take a look at it under the microscope. But if you look at this, there's a critical mistake being made in this slide. What is that? No, no gloves. Okay. Some of these things can be transmissible to us. So if it's bacterial or fungal or parasitic, it might be something that you can get. And so, yeah, you do want to wear gloves when you do these things. So we look at it under the microscope, and that's what we see. It's mange. Red foxes are incredibly susceptible to mange. Um, and, in fact, this is one of the great killers of red foxes. Um, certainly that fox wouldn't have been able to feed itself, that's why it was down to six pounds. You know, it was feeling lousy, it couldn't see worth a darn. And think about what would happen as the weather gets colder if its fur was that bad. It would freeze to death. So this is a great killer of red foxes. Interestingly enough, I have never seen or read about a case in a gray fox. Gray foxes do not get mange. They're very different animals. They're in different genera. Um, I don't know why. There's some other things. Did it have to do with the construction site? Sorry? Did it have to do with the construction site? I think it had nothing to do with the construction okay. site. My guess is, and I'm making this up, so take it for what it's worth. Um, if it was a construction site, there was probably garbage around, and some of that garbage would have been food from lunch. And this was a really hungry animal. It would probably smelled a piece of a bologna sandwich. So I think that's probably why it was at the construction site. But when I'm having the vet students go through the exercise, one of the things that we talk about is chemical burns and thermal burns, because oftentimes at a construction site they'll have fires burning off you know, old lumber or something like that. So there's a variety of other things that we talk about as well. But we know this is mange. The nice thing about mange is we can cure it. You know, if we can get the animal in pretty quickly with drugs like ivermectin, and pain meds and antibiotics because there's secondary bacterial infections too. And you treat her just a short period of time. Oh, that's the same animal. You know, less than two weeks later. She's not better. You know, she's not cured, but she's feeling better. You know, that's an animal that wants to eat and has some life in her and so forth. But the problem that we have now, and maybe you can see it around the eyes, is that the, the mange had damaged the tissue so much that her eyelids were damaged and, and curved in so that the lashes rub on the eye, a problem we call entropion. And that's not something that 
an animal can live with. It's very painful and can damage the, the cornea of the eye and the vision pretty readily. But you can, you can do entropian surgery. You can surgically reshape the eyelids. And it's kind of a fun surgery. But um, we, you know, being at a veterinary school, we have the, the luxury of having specialists around. So rather than me doing it or having one of the students, we called ophthalmology. And we got a really expensive ophthalmologist, uh, Dr. Pizzarelli, to come over and do a freebie <laughs> on his day off. Um, and so he brought all his cool tools, all his fancy little ophthalmologic surgical instruments, and did entropian surgery on our fox. And there she is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How much does she weigh there? Um, you know, the short answer is I don't remember, but more. <laughs> no, knowing the way that she f we, f we feed animals, if 11 is average, she's probably 14 <laughs> at this point. Um, you can see her first not all the way grown back yet. She's not ready to release, but we're getting there. And of course, she's not immune. You know, she will be susceptible to this again in the future, but we've gotten her through this issue. We get calls, since we're on skin diseases, I thought I'd talk about this. We get calls all the time about bald birds, blue jay, grackle in this case. And anybody know what season of the year we get these calls? It's very specific. Mid-August to mid-September. Okay. Are we dealing here with a disease? We're dealing with molt. That's exactly it. And, but the public doesn't always know this. They see these birds at their bird feeder, and they're sure that the next Ebola virus is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and they don't know what those holes are in the side of the bird's head. They've never seen the ears before. Um, and so we get these panicked calls by people. And so part of what we do, too, is environmental education. Don't worry. Your children won't catch it. Um, you know, it's just a mold. They do look reptilian, though. Oh, they are. They absolutely are. <clears throat> Another thing where we do a lot of environmental education <laughs> is talking to people about the value of <coughs> hollow trees. Um, you saw earlier when we were talking about orphans, I showed you baby squirrels, and that's a lot of baby squirrels get orphaned because people are cleaning up their yards in the spring and they're cutting down mm. hollow trees or cutting off dead branches. And, and hollow trees are a natural resource for a lot of different species. You know, wood ducks, raccoons, screech owls. I love that screech owl in the aspen. <laughs> He's sure you can't see him. <laughs> but the trick with, with species that find hollow trees as, as nice homes is that they've got in their mind a template of what a good cavity looks like size of the hole and the depth and things like that. Those templates sometimes fit inappropriate things, um, like chimneys. <laughs> or uh, ducks for wood stoves. And so we get calls all the time. I can't tell you how many calls we get um, from people who have a wood stove or people who have a chimney without a cap on it or something like that, about their hearing noises. <laughs> you know, what could it be? Or worse, they heard a noise and they started a fire <laughs> to scare the animal out. And so we get burned animals or pieces of burned animals um, all the time for identification. And animal control officers deal with this all the time and they know about it. And so getting people to understand that, you know, although this doesn't look like an inviting hole in, a, in an aspen tree to us, it looks perfect to a wood duck or a screech owl. Mm -hmm. And we get screech owls and wood ducks and raccoons and mergansers and all kinds of cavity nesting animals because they get in there and the walls are really smooth and then they can't get back out mm -hmm. and they're stuck. And the other issue that we get is somebody will hear the scratching around in their wood stove and they'll open the door. <laughs> and then the raccoon's in the house. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then you have a different problem um, where you really need a professional animal control officer to come in and help. But there are wonderful species that you know, use these sorts of cavities. Um, you know, chimney swifts are another one. 
that, you know, they're very specialized. They've evolved to use hollow trees, but they love the cavities that we produce. And so, again, educating people on things that we can do to keep the natural resources like hollow trees around, change our forest management pro processes a little bit. And also, you know, there are times of the year where you don't want to be firing up the stove, <laughs> especially if you don't have it capped. Okay. I'm going to switch to any questions at this point? Can I just ask you a question Please. about the uh, politics and the money and all this? So oh, was, my goodness. Huh? I was thinking about that earlier when you were talking, yeah. before you mentioned um, the cost of things. How does Tufts then give you folks a budget to work with? I mean, okay. how does this... <laughs> <laughs> we make it up as we go along. Um, um, basically, if you look at the wildlife clinic, and again, I haven't been the director in several years now, but we used to have a budget, an annual budget, of about three hundred thousand dollars for your school for your school. for the wildlife okay. clinic program. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, of that three hundred thousand dollars, the majority of it is uh, salaries for the people who work there, the staff okay. and the, the faculty members. Um, mm -hmm. And what the school gives us is the proportion of the salary that goes towards teaching students. So the, the hours that we spend in the clinics or in the classroom with students were compensated for from the hard money budget of the veterinarians. Well, the hard money budget comes from student tuitions and donations and state appropriations and a whole variety of different things. <coughs> Beyond that, um, the, the, any additional salary money we need to do educational programs or the actual cost of caring for and medicating the animals, we have to raise every year. Um, and so, you know, part of that we do through trying to get donations at the door. We ask for donations when people bring in animals. We average about $12 per donation per, per animal coming in the door. We average about $12. Our costs are probably about $400 per animal. Um, so it's, it's not a balanced equation. Um, and so one of the important responsibilities that the faculty have is writing grants. And so we spend quite a bit of time every so is it year. Like the NIH uh, I, I wish yeah. we I wish we were um, eligible for big no. money like that. No, it tends to be smaller stuff. Okay. Um, so who are the grant givers? Like what is what what groups? Uh, it it ranges widely and it's a moving target. Mm -hmm. um, it can be individuals who are interested in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I am not averse to going out to lunch with little old ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I you know if they like what we do and. and, and you know, there's a there's a match there. I'm happy to, to have them support some of what we do. Um, some of the grants are for scientific research to work on some of our lead work or mercury or anticoagulant toxicosis. Some of it is straight science sorts of things. Some of the grants we have are educational grants to put together teaching modules, either on the web or things of that nature. It's a wide variety of different things. So the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, the Dr. Scholl Foundation, the Quimby Foundation in Maine, um, it, the New Hampshire Charitable Trust, I, you know, uh -huh. and, and as with most nonprofits, you probably write 10 or 12 grants for every one you actually get. <laughs> um, most so of there the, is no governmental, there's absolutely not no support a penny, from. Not mm -hmm. a penny. Even, not a penny. Even, interestingly enough, when we're dealing with federally endangered species. Hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things that we, we find when we are doing this, you know, as I was saying, some of it's trauma, but sometimes you actually do make interesting discoveries, and I put on here, and this is a very abbreviated list, of some of the new diseases we've started to see in wildlife just in the, you know, in the last 10 years or so, in the time, well, 1999 for West Nile virus, but in the time when I've been at the wildlife clinic, there's new stuff. And partly by looking at these animals close up the way we do, we can pick up some of these diseases quicker. And we're part of the uh, New England Wildlife Disease Network. It's headquartered in my building. And we're looking at diseases in a wide variety of different species. White nose, the bats, uh, the new fungal skin disease. This is a timber rattlesnake. Um, and they're fun to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, or winter ticks in, mooses, in moose, which is a huge problem. Um, you wouldn't think ticks could kill a 2,000-pound moose. Um, but, you know, when you get 
between 40 and 100,000 ticks, big ticks, both sucking the blood on that, and then it's itchy, and you can see that the moose rub themselves raw. Uh, then they can't stay warm in the winter. Um, and this is a climate change problem. When the winters were colder, um, the ticks couldn't complete their life cycle, and tick populations were very low. As the winters start to warm up, um, moose are having more and more problems with this. And moose populations in some states, particularly in the middle part of the country, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, southern Canada, are plummeting um, because of the winter tick problems. So one disease that I'll highlight um, is in black bears. We, we don't see a lot of black bears. We see a few every year. And they tend to be young of the year, or like this one, yearlings that are you know, getting into trouble someplace, usually getting hit by cars um, or inappropriately shot or something like that. And again, this is the standard anesthesia machine. Uh, this is actually an adult human anesthesia machine this bear is on. Um, and that's probably about, oh, I don't know, 120 pound bear, something like that. Um, but what we started finding, and we're seeing it more and more regularly, is some of these animals we're not healthy, and I'm going to show you if, it, if this works. I hope this works. On the right there, there's going to be a little film clip. Let's see if this, oh, it's going to go. Yeah. So this is a bear in, come on, where's my one, two, there we go. This is a bear um, in the Berkshires in Massachusetts last winter. A yearling bear, just about the size of the one we saw. In, just Don't worry about the people talking, but just watch the behavior. Mm. Uh, sorry the camera isn't steadier, but we'll get off that apple tree in a minute. This bear was trying to run away from the people, and you see what's happening? Yeah, it's like it's got no balance. It keeps falling down. And so um, and we've seen a number like this, and so this bear was put down. And when we looked at its brain under the microscope, the electron microscope, this is what it looked like. And we've discovered this is what's called a, a uh, storage disease. It's a, a G1 gangliosidosis. And what this means is that some chemicals that are typically receptors on the surface of nerve cells in the brain don't get metabolized properly. And they build up in, in lysosomes into these sort of layered structures that are very abnormal. And this was first described in people. So people were a good animal model for this. There are several different kinds of gangliosidosis. This is a GM1. A GM2 gangliosidosis, some of you may have heard of Tay-Sachs disease, which is another one. So because the material, the abnormal material has to build up over time, you don't see this in babies. You don't see this in young animals. What happens is that as they start getting older, this builds up more and more and interferes with the, with the function of the brain. And in people, typically in their late preteen or early teen years is when these things tend to show up. And in bears, it seems to be showing up as yearlings. And we seem to be seeing it more and more. So this is newly described. The first paper on it is just out. Is um, it genetic, though? Is it, isn't it is genetic? absolutely genetic. Yeah. Yes. And at this point, we don't know how widespread it is. Um, Do you know what actually causes it? We, we don't have a clue in any species, including people. Um, I mean, because it's genetic, I mean, some of it is just, pass, as with Tay-Sachs, it's just passed down within a family. Um, and so a person or an animal can be heterozygous for this, not have the pair of genes, and it won't express itself, and you can pass it on from generation to generation. Um, and we really don't know much about it in bears. We don't know. It, it's certainly not an infectious agent, but whether it could be related to anything else going on in the environment, we don't know. Another emerging disease, and it's not emerging here, but it's close by, and that's on the Great Lakes, is botulism. Okay. This is the shore of Lake Erie last fall. Okay. Um, those are... Um, loons and long-tailed ducks. Oh. Thousands of them. 
dead on the shores of the lake, on, on the U.S. side and on the Canadian side. And when this first happened, people thought, oh, there's, you know, it's a pollutant. There's something poisonous in the environment. It's a chemical. It's, they, somebody sprayed something. Well, to make a long story short, what we've done is we've changed the ecosystem of the Great Lakes by introducing species that don't belong there. And <clears throat> let, me, let me actually go to the next slide and I'll come back to this. So there's actually a report on the web. Um, if you want to go and download this, you can get the whole thing as a PDF or as a PowerPoint. And there's a, a very nice and very scary description of what's going on here. But basically, many of you have been to Lake Champlain, right? What's changed in Lake Champlain in the last 30 to 50 years? Zebra mussels. Okay, what's happened to the water in Lake Champlain? Increased phosphorus. Yeah, and it's gotten clearer. Anybody notice that? I mean, when I was a kid and I'd go to Lake Champlain, you could see down a little bit. But, you know, there was a lot of algae in there and it was, you know, it wasn't really clear water. You go there now and you stand on the dock by the Science Museum and you look down, it's like glass. You can see way down into the water. The reason for this is we've introduced a couple of mussels, a couple of invertebrates, the quagga mussel and the zebra mussel, into a whole series of fresh water systems in the United States, including some of the Great Lakes, the Eastern Great Lakes in particular. And they grow, because the sunlight's penetrating further down, they can grow deeper um, than many other species were able to grow before. Um, and they have cleared the water because they're sucking all the algae and all the plankton out of it. They're plankton feeders. So they, these have made the water much clearer. And now the light penetrates further. And you're getting activity, particularly blue-green bacteria activity, much deeper down into the water, sometimes at depths where there's no oxygen. And that's a bad thing to do because in soil and in the mud at the bottom of the lakes, there's a group of bacteria called Clostridium, a genus of bacteria called Clostridium, and one of them is Clostridium botulinum. And under certain environmental conditions, when there's a lot of nutrients but not much oxygen, it produces botulism toxin. And so now we've got botulism toxin being produced down in the lake water, and it can get into the mussels. This is bad enough. But we've also introduced another species, and that's a little fish called the round goby. And it turns out the round goby loves to eat mussels, young mussels. And now we've got a cycle. Botulism is occurring. It's getting into the shellfish. The round goby is starting to eat some of these shellfish. And what happens when a, a fish gets sick? It floats up to the top. It could float up to the top. Before it dies, it probably acts funny probably swims funny, it's probably not as scared of predators, and so it's easy for a loon or a merganser to catch it. And so that's what's happening to these loons and diving ducks and so forth on the lakes, is they're either eating the toxic shellfish, like long-tailed ducks, or they're eating the fish that have eaten the toxic shellfish and getting botulism toxin. Where did these get into the Great Lakes? They didn't come from Mars. Imported by boats. Yeah. Okay. They came in ballast water in boats. It turns out that the shellfish and the fish have eggs that are what we call planktonic. The, the eggs float around in the surface of water, and they're very light, and they're eaten by tons of different kinds of organisms. But you know what ballast water in ships is? is are, the, it's for weight to displace carbon. Yeah. I mean, if you have a, sh a big ship, an international cargo ship that's going someplace and it's picking up refrigerators or automobiles or corn. It sits low in the water when it's full and then it sails to the port that it's going to and it offloads the corn or the refrigerators. And then it's got to take on some more weight before it can sail back. Because if it sails back empty, it's going to be top heavy and tip over in storms and things. So it takes, so it takes on water from locally. It just fills its tanks with water and then it sails back and then it pumps the water out before it takes on another load of cargo. So you're moving 
millions of tons of water back and forth from one place to another. And the mussels came over in ballast water from Asia, and the round go goby came over in ballast water from the Caspian Sea. And they met in the Great Lakes, <laughs> and they loved it. And they have changed the chemistry and the fisheries in the Great Lakes, and they're killing millions and millions of fish eating, or and they're killing bigger fish, too. They're killing a lot of predators with botulism. And this is really, really hard now to correct. Once we've broken the system, it's not easy to fix it. <clears throat> now, because people have figured out what's going on with ballast water, new regulations have been put in place to filter ballast water and treat ballast water. But A, the cat's out of the bag with this. <clears throat> and B, we don't have control over all international shipping. There's still a lot of ships of convenience that don't obey the regs on ballast water. So this is a big problem <coughs> and it's reflected by what's going on here. <coughs> now botulism is a huge issue um, and we see it in a lot of different species. It doesn't usually cause major mortalities. But it's interesting that <coughs> there's a group of species that aren't very sensitive to botulism. What do you think they might be? Cormorant. No, cormorants actually die pretty readily from botulism. That's good. <laughs> okay. Think about species that, that make their living eating dead rotten stuff. Seagulls? Gulls. Seagulls. Gulls. 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 Okay. Um, it turns out that this group of animals is pretty resistant. And most of the work that's been done has been on turkey vultures, New World vultures. Um, a lot of the scientific work on botulism was done in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Um, a, a lot of the big experimental work. Because it was the, it was the uh, depression. And people were doing a lot of home canning. And if you don't can things right, what happens? You get botulism. You get those bulky cans and people die. Um, and so there, were, there was a lot of money invested in studying botulism back then. And, and I, I've got a paper in my files. I've literally got a hard copy of the original paper from 1939. Um, and they did a study where they were in a laboratory and they were simply trying to determine how toxic botulism toxin was. And you can imagine what laboratory people would do. They'd take some mice and they'd give them the toxin and they'd see how much toxin it took to kill the mice. And then they tried dogs and then they tried a few other species. And they have tables of how much botulism toxin it took to, and most species died pretty readily. For some reason that I don't understand, they also had a couple of turkey vultures. <laughs> in the, they don't talk about that in the paper. I don't know where they got the turkey vultures. So what do you think happened? It didn't die. It didn't die. So you're a good scientist. You give the turkey vultures a little botulism. It doesn't affect them. What do you do? Give them more. Bingo. <laughs> so they kept bringing the dose up. And they went to, and I'm not kidding here, they went to 30,000 times the human lethal dose. Mm -hmm. And they were able to cause no clinical symptoms. The vultures were fine. <coughs> No one has ever followed up that study to see why vultures are immune to botulism toxins. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's a wonderful piece of evolutionary <coughs> heritage. Here's a species that in its natural setting is going to be exposed to this sort of thing, not to mention infectious diseases and everything, constantly. And they have evolved immunity to that particular toxin. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love to figure out how they do it. How are we doing on time? Because I'm paying no attention. We have to be out by now. What time is it? 8.30. Okay. A little more? Sure. You have a slide that had energy farms on it, and I think it was it's two or three slides back. Let's go look. Let's energy farms? Before this. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, here we go. <coughs> yeah. As a threat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and I, again, I don't think we need to take time to go into this in any depth tonight. You know, we're all interested in alternative energy sources, um, things moving beyond the petroleum um, era. And we're talking about wind, and we're talking about 
solar, and we're talking about geothermal. <coughs> Some people are talking about nuclear. I don't know if I can mention that in southern Vermont. Um, <laughs> but, you know, all of those have environmental costs associated with them in one way or another. And so with energy farm development, certainly with wind turbines, there's lots of literature on there about birds and bats um, encountering wind turbines. And there are many studies going on right at the moment about problems associated with that. Clearly, the kind of technology you use for your turbine and where you site them and the rate of speed that they're set for can have major impact on whether you kill animals or not. And I'm no expert. I just know enough to be dangerous, as with many things. The same sort of thing is true with solar um, in placements. <clears throat> I mean, small-scale solar, as you see on many people's roofs, is, seems to be wonderful <clears throat> and have very limited impact. But they are having some issues that the federal government is putting some serious money into studying that right now with the massive solar emplacements that they're putting in the western part of the country where there are you know, thousands of acres of banked solar furnaces and things. <clears throat> and um, those actually attracting animals to their death. Or in some cases, actually frying birds in the air <laughs> that fly through the concentrated um, heat that's going up to the steam towers. So there's, there's people who are studying that at the moment, and I, again, I don't know enough to be dangerous, but it's something that we need to know more about before I think we as a society move very far in those directions. Okay. It would be interesting to know if those turkey vultures could take as much vulture as they did in It's a great question. There you go. You've got your research. Well, you want a research project? <laughs> I can get you some turkey vultures. <laughs> okay. <coughs> this, I hope this will be interesting. I thought we'd talk about sex for a while. Um, okay. So, here we've got waterfowl. You all know waterfowl, the, the order Anseriformes, um, ducks, geese, and swans. <coughs> Why are ducks dimorphic and geese and swans aren't? Okay, and I mean you can all tell a boy mallard from a girl mallard, or a boy gadwall from a girl gadwall, or a boy merganza from a girl merganza, but swans and geese, you know, there's a little bit of size difference. If it lays an egg, you're pretty sure it's a girl. Um, <laughs> but parental care in the nest, so that the female stays in the nest, and the male. Stays parental stays. care is part of it. Okay. <clears throat> what do we know about? Well, uh, let's uh, let's stay with that because that's a good place to start. Let's think about mallards. <clears throat> Tell me about parental care in mallards. What do the males do? And what do the females do? The males do nothing. The males do nothing. Okay. Do they help build a nest? No. no. Do they help incubate the eggs? No. no. Do they lead the young around and help protect them from predators? No. 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 Okay. How about swans? They mate for life. Well, they're said to mate for life. It's sort of like people. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they mate for long periods of time. They may change their minds occasionally. Um, Joint custody. Okay, but the male helps with the nest, and the male helps with incubation, and the male helps protect the young from predators. He's, as we would say in anthropomorphic terms, he's a good dad. So he hangs around and does his part, as I've heard some women say to me. Um, okay, but this is not just reflected in the outside of the bird, it's also reflected in the inside of the bird, <coughs> and in a lot of interesting biology. So, here's an x-ray of a mallard. <clears throat> and I put yellow arrows on a couple of things. One, see this thing up here that looks sort of like a snail shell? Okay, keep your eye on that. The other one is, do you see two big round things down here? Mm -hmm. What do you suppose those might be? Eggs. Eggs precious. Those are testes. Okay, those are bird balls. Um, <laughs> And so, so, let's go back a slide. Suppose I told you, so your average mallard around here weighs about 800 grams, <coughs> something like a pound and a half, something of that nature. Th these are not swans from around here. <coughs> these are from out west. But your average swan around here 
is 20 pounds. Okay? Suppose I told you that his testes are four times the size of his testes. Huh. So now we've got external sexual dimorphism, and we've got different, big difference in the size of the testes. What's going on here? Okay. The other thing we've got, this snail shell up here, see, how, see the trachea, see this black tube coming down here? That's the breathing tube, the trachea. And this thing here, when the trachea comes down <coughs> in us, in a mammal, gets down to somewhere near around your heart and then it divides into two tubes called bronchi and one goes to each lung. And in birds, at that division, <coughs> what we call the bifurcation because it divides into two, at the bifurcation of the trachea. That's where the bird's voice box is, down there. It's not up here, it's down there. <clears throat> and it's called the syrinx, S-Y-R-I-N-X. It's named after the pipes of Pan in Greek mythology. So it's right there. <clears throat> and in male ducks, not geese, not swans, in male ducks, the syrinx has a big cartilaginous enlargement of it called the syringeal bulla. So, this is a syrinx of a more typical bird. This is actually a loon. <clears throat> but you can see the trachea. You can see the bronchi coming off. And that's the syrinx. Nothing very complicated. <clears throat> now let's look at a, um, that's a golden eye. Um, it's a male duck. So here's the heart down here. Here's something that's bigger than the heart, <laughs> just above it. That's the bulla. And it's this echo chamber. It's part of the bird's voice box. <clears throat> and it must be important because it's bigger than the heart. <clears throat> and the other thing is if you look at the trachea going up his neck, there's an enlargement in the middle of that too called the tracheal bulb. <clears throat> and, when you, and so male ducks have these very sex-specific vocalizations they do that must sound really good to female ducks <laughs> <clears throat> because they invest a lot of anatomy and a lot of energy into making those structures. And this is a our male common merganser. I, in fact, I saw some nearby when I was coming up today. So again, here's his trachea coming into his chest. Here's his heart down here. There's the two lobes of the liver. And there's his big syringeal bulla. And here it is close up. So there's big cartilaginous enlargement. <clears throat> and you can see the two bronchi coming off there, one going to each lung. <clears throat> so he's got big testes. He's got Externally, he looks different, <coughs> and he's got this bulla that must be really sexy. You know, the, the, the Elvis of birds, I don't know. Is that um, analogous to Adam's apple? You know, in many ways it is. In many ways it is. It's, <coughs> it's an enlargement of the cartilages, and clearly sex hormones play a role <coughs> in that enlargement, sure. <coughs> and so the question now, let's go back to the testes part. We know about the male mallard is not such a good dad compared to the male swan. Why the difference in testes size? Why does the male mallard have testes bigger than the male swan? What's different? This all has to do with pair bonds. Somebody said the swans mate for life. <clears throat> and that's sort of close. How long do mallards mate for? However long it takes. <laughs> OK. Five minutes, six minutes, <laughs> something like that, as long as it takes him to chase her, yeah. right. And then he's on to another. And then he's gone, that's right. It's, it's what we sometimes call the Friday night bar scene. Um, <laughs> sure. Produce more sperm. Okay, so now I know this is hard for some of you, but think about this from the male's perspective. <laughs> okay, and with the swans, okay, the male is going to get to mate with that same female multiple times. <clears throat> So the chances are, if she has young, they're his, okay? Because they've had multiple matings. Now with the mallard, he's got one shot. So he's got to produce a large volume of, sper of ejaculate with a lot of spermatozoa in the ejaculate. Because she's going to go on and mate with other males. And so we call this in evolutionary biology, sperm swamping. He's, his ejaculate has to overpowered by volume and concentration any other males that she happens to mate with. So that's why his testes are so big. If he's going to get his genes into the next generation, he can only do that through a female. And he's got to produce as, met, as much semen 
with the highest concentration of sperm as he possibly can. So the mallard testes are way bigger than the swan's testes. So all this goes together. So does the female receive only the sperm from one mallard? Did oh, it turns out there's a whole field, there's a whole field of female duck biology that has exploded in the last 20 years. It used to be, and this is totally sexist, you can imagine. It, it used to be that all the male ornithologists assumed that, you know, whatever male she mates with first is going to inseminate the eggs and, you know, anything else is by luck. But it turns out that the female is much sneakier than we thought. Um, and this is due to, and I, I'm going to space her name, I'm embarrassed. There's a, a biologist at Yale who works with the Sibley Waterfowl Conservancy in, in Connecticut. And she's the first one to do studies of the female reproductive tract of ducks. <coughs> the, the literature on the male reproductive tracts of ducks was all done in the 1880s and 1890s. It's long now, but it wasn't until the 1990s that anybody ever looked at the female reproductive tract. And it turns out that the female can be choosy. She can mate with multiple males, and she can decide which male sperm get to fertilize the eggs mm -hmm. by sidetracking the sperm ejaculations into parts of her, <laughs> of her cloaca where it's not going to get to fertilized eggs. So she can actually exert, I don't know that it's conscious control, but biological control over which male gets to fertilize the eggs. So there's a really interesting body of literature on that. I worked on a study in Tasmania with uh, Tasmanian native hens. The oh, cool. females have um, harems of males. Yeah. And, um, and so they were looking to see if they were all related males. Sure. Was kin selection. Or and what did they find? Um, I'm not sure to tell you the okay. truth. Because it, it went on for a long time yeah. and then they switched to some other species. Yeah. Um, and it's sure. always interesting to look at exceptions like that. It's like mm -hmm. looking at phalaropes, where the female, you know, those little shorebirds, where the females are more brightly colored and will mate with multiple males and things of that nature. So the exceptions always can show you really interesting things about biology. Okay, enough about sex for the moment? <laughs> okay. Now, when I've been here before and talked about loons, we've talked about, a lot about lead poisoning, and we won't focus on that tonight, but I want to focus on some of the other things we find from <coughs> looking in birds' stomachs. So this is the stomach contents of a loon that we did a necropsy on a couple of weeks ago, I think. And so you can see it's got a variety of rocks in here. A lot of these rocks are quartzite. And what are these? This is from, this is from a lake in New Hampshire. Crayfish. Crayfish claws. Okay. And if I were a better invertebrate zoologist, we could probably figure out the species of crayfish, and maybe even the gender from that. Uh, and there actually is a crayfish biologist at Plymouth State College that I'm working with on this stuff. So here's another loon stomach, and you can see here a piece of lead, a piece of lead fishing. That's what actually killed the bird. But you can see that the sick loon was eating a lot of other invertebrates. <laughs> so you can see a lot of crayfish. There's a dragonfly larva over here. And then these are um, called the Chinese mystery snail. This is an introduced pest species of snail. It's been introduced into a lot of North America. And a bunch of rocks. <coughs> so you can learn a lot about what birds eat under different situations by opening these up. Mm -hmm. You are what you eat. Okay. So here's more contents. And you know, one of the questions, and we've talked about this before, when we're looking at a piece of lead like that, is why did the bird pick it up? And is, it, is there something about the rocks? Is it picking up things that are similar in size to the rocks? But we've started to ask the question, what about the rocks? Yeah, what are the rocks for? What a, well, A, what are they for? And B, what can we learn from them? This is what comes from having a brother who's a geologist. Um, <laughs> you got to look at the rocks, right? Um, and so you're, whoever said over here brought up a very good point. Why do loons swallow rocks? For grinding. Help digestion. Well, maybe. Think about other birds that eat fish. Okay? N can you name some other fish-eating birds? Pelicans. Hmm? Pelicans. Yes. Herons. Herons. Cormorants. 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 <coughs> Morganters. Oh, you diving birds. Yeah, some of you diving birds. Okay. Virtually none of them regularly have rocks in their stomachs. 
Ballast. Okay, I'm, I'm, not say, I'm not saying it's not to help grind because clearly loons eat things other than fish and maybe it helps with the snails. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> some of those other birds eat things besides fish too. So ballast is an interesting question. <clears throat> Does it help them to dive? The short answer is I don't think so because it's such a small percentage of their body weight. But I was talking to a biologist just last week. This is the advantage of going to scientific meetings and talking to people who know things you don't know. And he said, maybe it helps when they're flying. Okay. Loons, I don't know if you know about this, loons have a really hard time flying. Their wings are barely big enough to get them off the water, and they have to flap like the dickens to stay airborne. If they tried to glide, they'd fall out of the sky. You know, they can't soar. They have to just flap and they fly straight lines, and they fly really fast. They're just balanced on the evolutionary edge. If they lost, if they had any smaller wings, they'd be penguins. Um, no, I'm serious about that. Um, and so, maybe, and, and what he said to me is, think about when you go to a doctor's office and you stand on a scale and they, they've got this beam that goes across the top and you have this weight that goes across there. How far do they have to move that weight before the beam moves? <laughs> Not very far. And what he, I was showing him an x-ray and he said, you know, loons, gizzards, is further back in their body than most other birds. And I've never noticed that before. And he said, what if you take even just a small amount of weight and you move it out there, what does that do to the stability of their flight? And I don't have a clue. But it, what a great thought. <clears throat> and so now we're going to start looking at, I'm going to be comparing the mass of the, the rocks in there and where they are in the loon's body. So that's one thing. It may, have, it may have to do with grinding. It may have to do with ballast. It may be a combination of things. We don't understand that yet. But the other thing we've noticed, look at how similar all those rocks are. The rocks are telling us something, and I don't think I'm smart enough to figure out quite what they're telling us yet. Partly, they may tell us the geography of where the loons are feeding. You know, if they're, feeding, if they're picking up rocks locally, the rocks may represent something about the habitat that the loons are feeding on. The other thing we know about rocks is that, any of you ever done a rock tumbler? What happens to rocks in a rock tumbler? Smoother and? And, ground. and smaller. They get ground down, right? And so eventually these rocks are going to get small enough that the loon can pass them. And as rocks are being ground up, are rocks chemically inert? No, they got stuff in them. They've got minerals, they've got metals, they've got calcium and magnesium. So maybe they're vitamin pills. You know, maybe they're vitamins and maybe there's something in here that they need as a mineral. So I don't know the answer. So I'm, again, trying to work on people. Yeah. If if they're not for if they're not for grinding, yeah. why would they get ground down? Is it just just happenstance that they're the bird is moving around and other muscles are moving things? Yeah, I I think the nature of a gizzard yeah. and, and if you think of if we think of the other fish eating birds, the gannets and the cormorants and the herons and things, their gizzards are you know, yeah. pulsing and grinding, and that's how gizzards work. Um, so I think it may be that they're being ground down is just a, 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 an accident of being in the right place at the right time. But that's a guess. Mm -hmm. and, and probably as in biology, it's going to turn out to be a little bit of all of the things. It's not going to be one or the other. But I love asking these questions and then trying to figure out how it works. And these are great projects for students to work on. <clears throat> is it just a function of the fact that they eat snails and crayfish, which have a hard exoskeleton? Well, and fish? here's one of the questions that I don't know, and, and you know, I'm embarrassed to say I have data that we haven't examined yet. Um, we know that birds eat more invertebrates. They eat more snails and they eat more crustaceans on the ocean in the winter than they do on fresh water in the summer. And I can't tell you whether they have more rocks when they're eating invertebrates than they do when they're eating fish. But I've saved every rock from every loon we've ever opened up. So we can go back and retrospectively look at that. And every loon you've opened up has rocks? Every, well, every one that's over about four weeks of age. They don't, when they're really little, they don't eat rocks. No. And that's another question, is at what age do they start? And are they picking them up themselves or are the parents feeding them the rocks? I don't know the answer to that yet. So there's all these things we just don't know. It's cool.
Um, and this is one species. So I'm going to stay with the fishing gear theme for a minute. We're going to switch off looms and talk about fish hooks. So we see fish hooks in a lot of different species. Here's yet another snapping turtle, and this one's anesthetized. And this one we have, this is just a piece of PVC tubing to hold the mouth open so it won't bite through the endotracheal tube. And those are my fingers, so I want to make sure it's well anesthetized. Um, and that's just a relatively minor piece of surgery to get that out. But we do see a lot of other hooks in things. These were in the stomach and the intestines of this snapping turtle. That one actually killed that herring gull. So we do see a lot of fishing gear ingestion. This is a loon that died from fish hook ingestion. Um, and what I'm finding is a lot depends on where the fish hook is as to how traumatic it is. This is right up by the heart, and that hook actually punctured through the wall of the esophagus and hit a blood vessel. But this next one, this is a loon that came into a rehabilitation center in Maine, Avian Haven up in Freedom, Maine, um, and on September 3rd. I can read the x-rays, okay? And they emailed me this x-ray, and they said, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, you know, when I look at that, the hook is down close here. There's the rocks in the gizzard. Yeah. The hook's down there near the stomach. So I know that it's an acid environment, and there's rocks there to grind it. I said, is the loon sick? <laughs> um, what would happen if we just watched it for a little while? So I, we watched it, and we just took sequential x-rays. And here's the bird 10 days later, on the 13th. Can you see the hook? Okay. There's a little piece of it right here, and the curved part of it's right there, but mostly it's digested. Wow. Okay. It's going to be gone. Um, and whoops, oh, I've left out the most important slide. This is me being stupid. Um, the next slide that was supposed to be here is on the 20th, the bird being released, and it's a really nice picture. So imagine that in your mind. <laughs> so, you know, one of the questions is how do they get digested and how long does it take? Um, and nobody's going to take a loon and feed it uh, fish hooks, I hope. Um, but so we did a little project, and we have to follow up on this and do some more. But we took fishing gear. That's a jig head. We bought it, big sporting goods. Um, and then I had to learn about rock tumblers. I learned that there's two kinds. There's rotary and vibratory. Um, <coughs> And we wanted to see, what we want to do is mimic a loon's stomach. So we put, we took rocks, we went out and bought quartzite pebbles of about the same size, and we made up artificial stomach acid, and we put it in the rock tumbler, and we tumbled these for a while. We changed the acid every day so we keep its pH down. And here's what happened to the fishing gear. Okay, turned to that, and then it turned to that, and started to get to look just like what we find in the loon's stomachs takes between two and three weeks. Oh, here it is. It's just out of order. There's the bird being released. Yay! <laughs> so, it worked. <laughs> so, it's not just the fact it's a hook. It's where the hook is um, that can make a big difference here. It probably also depends on what the hook is made out of. And this is where, again, I'm running into my own lack of knowledge. I need a metallurgist. Um, because it turns out that hooks are made of a wide variety of different kinds of metals. And some of them used in salt water are stainless steel, and they don't digest. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them seem to digest very rapidly. And I think, you know, from a conservation point of view, what we want to do is be, encourage, be encouraging anglers to use fishing gear that disappears quickly. Mm -hmm. Monofilament that biodegrades in the sun rapidly, hooks that digest quickly, anything so that it will have less secondary impact. And that's true with things like plastics. You know, we always have problems with animals being entangled in plastic six-pack containers. Mm -hmm. These things should be illegal. Um, <clears throat> and monofilament line or on the ocean, uh, discarded netting like this gill net that this eider is caught in. Here's an osprey entangled in line, a candy goose entangled in line. So we see an awful lot of this, a loon entangled in line. Uh -huh. At least in this case, the, the split shot is on the outside. So we don't have to worry about poisoning there. We just have to worry about it starving to death or drowning. Uh, this is a long-eared owl that was entangled in uh, kite string. And it's going to have to stay in captivity until it molts out new feathers. <coughs> 
But one thing you wouldn't think of is soccer nets. Um, mm -hmm. There's something about owls and soccer nets. Uh, we see this on a fairly regular basis. Mostly great horned owls, but sometimes barred owls. Um, that, that young one there is clearly not happy. And it's a shame when you have to cut a perfectly good soccer net to get an owl out. Um, I like soccer too. But it's, it's the law of unintended consequences. You know, you don't think about a soccer net as being just like a, a, fish, a fixed fishing net. You know, we put up this net out there in the environment and things that are moving through nocturnally can get stuck in them. Have you experimented with different colors? Have not. No. It's a great question, though. And again, I'm only seeing this from a clinical point of view. We haven't done any experimental research. But, you know, as you say that, I'm thinking, well, I could, you know, send out a blast email to rehabilitators all over the country and say, when you find owls tangled in soccer nets, what are the colors of the soccer nets? We could begin to gather some baseline data. It's a great question. Okay. Um, okay. This is from a few weeks ago. This is a double crested cormorant. And it's not anesthetized. This is wrapped in a towel, that's all that smoky looking stuff, and it's sitting on the x ray plate. See anything that looks odd? Yeah. Well, it's just, it's got a long neck and it's got it curved in, but everybody see those two fish hooks down there in its stomach? Okay. Can you see those from where you're sitting? Okay. So, came in this way, it was sort of thin and weak. We figured, oh, the hooks are a real problem. It will give it some fluids and start it on antibiotics overnight. And tomorrow we'll prep it for surgery. Well, we're prepping it for surgery. We thought, well, we'll take another radiograph. We took the next radiograph. The next morning, there's no fish up. Same bird, 12 hours later. And so I said to the students, are you sure this is the same cormorant? Um, yeah. And so they searched around the bottom of the cage, and in the towels at the bottom of the cage, they found that. Mm -hmm. Rubber worms with the fish hooks in them. The mm -hmm. bird had coughed them up. They weren't embedded in anything. Mm -hmm. He just regurgitated them. And it turned out that his problem was parasites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the reason he was weak and had come in. The hooks had nothing to do with it. A red herring. A total red herring. So you never know in this business what you're going to run into. Here's a different one. This is a gannet, a northern gannet, that was found thin and weak on a beach on Cape Cod and was taken to a rehabilitation center where it died. Any idea what it might have died from? Looks like a nail, doesn't it? Like an eight penny nail. Mm. Okay. It was a nail. Okay. So what? <laughs> hmm? Is it blocking its digestion? No. No. Anybody been to a hardware store and bought nails? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if you're going to use them outdoors, what kind of nails do you got? Galvanized. 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 What does galvanized mean? They dipped in liquid zinc. Ah. Zinc is toxic. Mm -hmm. okay. That's what this bird died from. Mm -hmm. Zinc poisoning. Okay. The nail was just sitting there. Okay. Um, it was the zinc on the outside of the nail. Why did the gannet have that in it? And it's because of a practice called yo-yo fishing, which I'll talk about in another couple of minutes. So hang on to that. Here's a loon. Okay. Found on another coastal beach with another nail in it, a little bit smaller nail. Now if you look carefully, you sort of get the impression that the, you see the rocks there, mm -hmm. you see the gizzard here, you sort of get the impression that that nail may not be entirely within the gizzard. And when we opened it up, it wasn't. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here it was a more serious medical problem and that's why that bird died. So I'm not saying nails are benign by any stretch of the imagination. I'm saying each case is different. So yo-yo fishing, I didn't know anything about this until we started looking at these birds. And then there was an article <coughs> in, the, in the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries newsletter about yo-yo fishing, and they published this picture. And this is a kilogram, a kilogram, 2.2 pounds, 
of metal weights that were found in a single large striped bass caught off of Cape Cod. Okay? And we have here lead, we have here <coughs> straight sharp pieces of iron, and we have these, I'm not sure what they are, they call them yo-yo weights. And basically, and this is mostly an uh, ocean fishing technique, and that is when you're fishing for big stuff, um, you have big hooks, and you have big bait. So you're using a big chunk of fish or meat or offal <coughs> or something like that as bait. And what people do to get it to sink, because you know meat tends to float kind of thing, is they stick pieces of metal into the bait before oh. they toss it overboard. And then they put it in the water and they sort of yo-yo it up and down in the water column to attract the big fish that they're after. Hmm. And you know, sometimes you get a striped bass, and sometimes you get a tuna, and sometimes you get a shark, and sometimes you get a gannet, mm. or a loon, or some other thing that, you know, thinks this is great food. And so, um, the state of Massachusetts has outlawed marine yo-yo fishing um, because of some of these sorts of data that have come in, um, but it's still practiced widely uh, up and down the East Coast and on the West Coast and around the world. Mark, yeah. we're about to get evicted. Oh, we're about to get evicted, so it's probably about time to start. Stop. So, you know, the best part of what we do is releasing birds, like this red tail that came in with a broken wing, getting it to fly away, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. You are very welcome. And we hope you'll come back next year and do another. Hold still for a minute? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great.